Lord have mercy. In the land of cotton, old times are and not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away. Dixieland, in Dixieland, where I was born in early on one frosty morning. Look away, look away, look away. Dixieland, in a winter was in Dixie. Hooray, hooray. In Dixieland, the look right down to this and die. In Dixie, away, away, away down south in Dixie. The American South. We all have our preconceived notions about this magical part of our country. Barbecue, country music, moonshine, fireworks, rednecks, and much more. Since most of the South is comprised of Protestants, this place has been called the Bible Belt. Thanks to Hollywood, we generally put Southerners in the Amen, Praise the Lord, Hallelujah, Brother category. As a Northerner, who only recently discovered the true charm of the South, I admit that the stereotypical ideas I had of this place were completely false. But no matter what your beliefs are, one thing is for sure. Most people would never think of the South as fertile ground for orthodoxy. But over the past 15 years, numerous orthodox missions and parishes are popping up all over the South, and some even belong to the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. The very thought of that statement seems to contradict itself. Why would anyone in the former Confederate States be attracted to orthodoxy, let alone a jurisdiction that has its roots in the 1,000-year-old history of Holy Russia. My name is Reader Peter Lukianov, and together with the film crew of the Eastern American Diocese, we're traveling to South Carolina to investigate this phenomenon. We will take a look at the lives of the orthodox clergy and faithful that live there, where they work, where they live, where they pray, and even where they eat. And who knows, we might even catch a glimpse of what an entirely orthodox South Carolina would look like under the amphorian of the Russian Church abroad. If we want to properly understand the spirit of South Carolinians and why they are so principled and independent, then we need to start by looking at the very beginning. We are at the South Carolina Relic Room and Military History Museum to get a better understanding of why South Carolinians are so fiercely independent. Today we will meet with Mr. William J. Long, Curator for Education at this fine museum, and hopefully he'll be able to give us a better understanding of South Carolina. So Mr. Long, when we pulled into the Capitol for the first time, I was shocked to see the Confederate flag hanging in a place of honor. What's the, the meaning behind that? What does that flag mean to South Carolinians? Uh, the truth is that while a lot of people read a modern political meaning into it, to many Southerners, the battle flag almost takes the place uh, of a sort of a regional coat of arms. The St. Andrew's cross-based battle flag was never the official flag of the Confederate government. Instead, that was the pattern used by regiments to distinguish uh, their identity on the battlefield. And it's something that uh, many Southerners have been very fond of over the years, primarily as a symbol of valor. Uh, for many, it also connects with their roots. It's similar to the uh, flag of Scotland, for instance, uh, or even the uh, Russian naval flag, both based on the cross of St. Andrew. What is it about South Carolinians that makes them so independent? South Carolina's most famous unionist, uh, a man named Pettigrew, said at the time of secession that South Carolina is too small to be a republic and too large to be an insane asylum. But the truth is that South Carolina loved Pettigrew. He was a unionist, he disagreed with everyone around him, and he did it in a very frank and, and earnest and straightforward fashion. So but South Carolina is like the bully has, on the playground. Uh, South Carolina tends to be the provocateur. Not big enough to be the bully. South Carolina, uh, the, the school's symbol is the Gamecock. And that was the nickname of one of our revolutionary leaders. Now, a, a, a bantam rooster can't really be the bully of the barnyard, but it'll go pick a fight with anything. What is it about orthodoxy that, in your opinion, is so appealing to Southerners? I think there's a very manly appeal to orthodoxy. Manly appeal? How, how yeah. do, what do you mean? Yeah, well, it's not just that you guys have cool beards like I do. <laughs> um, 
It's, it's simply there's, there's challenge to the faith. Uh, it, it's not a lowest common denominator kind of thing. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's discipline and high standards and something to aspire to. Tradition. Tradition. There's a very strong streak of tradition in the South. Uh, this is a state that greatly values freedom and individualism, but not one that's ever thought that uh, that means you take order and structure out of life. It's independence, but it's independence with principle. Is yes. that correct? But uh, isn't that the, the essence of Christianity? You know, you have free will, you have independence, but you can choose to, you know, do good. And we believe, of course, as Orthodox and Christians, that if you live your life according to the commandments of Christ, you will inherit this. But you also have that free will to go and go in the complete other direction. So I guess, in essence, South Carolina is more about preserving that independence in, in principle and in good faith. I think there's a, uh, there's a strong spirit of that in this, in this state. Archpriest Mark Mancuso, Southern by birth, librarian by trade, an Orthodox priest by the grace of God, and a true Southern gentleman who embodies the very charm and principle that define this state. As he sat in his rocking chair and took in the gentle breeze of a warm Carolina summer night, he enlightened us Northern folk with a vivid description of his fellow citizens. We are a god praying people here in South Carolina and we see that sometimes the rest of the country doesn't follow suit. And so our independence is in a sense relative. It's defined over and against the other parts of this country that are not God-fearing. It's interesting to note that you can tell a South Carolinian or a Southerner from a Northerner um, by this simple thing. If you're in a conversation with a Southerner and a Southerner is first meeting you, a Southerner will ask you where you are from, and then the conversation will flow about where you come from. And it's all about what are you, where are your roots, what are your foundations, where are your principles? That's sort of behind that question, where are you from? But someone from the North might be uh, more inclined to ask someone, what do you do? What do you do for a living? What is your social status? What is your economic status? So we've established that Southerners are God-fearing people. But don't most religious people describe themselves as being God-fearing? So what exactly is it about orthodoxy that is so appealing to the South? I think common sense <laughs> is what appeals to us. Uh, I like, it makes sense, the theology makes sense. Well, perhaps it is uh, that people are a bit, some people would say with a little bit more conservative, a little bit more right wing, a little bit more myopic, I don't know. But that's really not the good reason. I think the best reason would be that they uh, have an interest in, in, in tradition. Uh, even the, uh, many of the American revolutionaries, as well as the Southern families, they all be, believe very much in tradition and family history and so forth with the turmoil in many of the other denominations that uh, is, is happening in the last couple of decades, we just find that uh, they're dissatisfied where they were. They've lost that assuredness, that port, so to speak, that they were harbored in. And so they started seeking, looking elsewhere. There's a real emptiness. And orthodoxy is filling that void, that people are tired of the entertainment. I mean, you go to these mega churches, they got these huge screens, and they're tired of entertainment. They're, and they're, they're starting to notice the emptiness. And when you come to an Orthodox church, what's the very first thing that you are able to do? You're able to think. You're able to think. And then when you stand in church, you not only reflect about your day, you're able to look at the saints, it helps you to get yourself together, and that's the appeal of orthodoxy in the South. St. Elizabeth, the New Martyr Church, is a parish of the Eastern American Diocese of Rocor and is located in South Carolina's capital city of Columbia. Founded in 1997 by a group of American converts, this parish is living proof that Southerners and Russians have much in common. The principal spirit of these people in search of the truth led them to discover an intimate connection with the life of their patron saint. Julian Wieland was a conservative Protestant, and much like St. Elizabeth, she came to orthodoxy of her own free will. We actually, she and I have a lot in common because um, her husband 
was, was Orthodox. And they told him not to um, force it on her, that she would come to it in her own time. And that's very true. You come to it and you see the, the person that you love um, leading an Orthodox life and having struggles that you have and see what they get out of it and, and go and attend the divine services, the vigil, the liturgy, all of it. And you open yourself to that, it, it opens up to you and it opens a whole new um, perspective. Although the parish is made up primarily of converts, there are several cradle-born Orthodox parishioners who have joined this community. We met people from all walks of life in different parts of the country who came together for no other reason than to glorify God. We were curious to find out how these two groups interacted. The first six years I, I was a member of this parish, I didn't know that there was such a thing as a, as a convert. I didn't know people just, you know, through their own study and their own journey, decided to be Orthodox. It was so awesome, you know, to hear the zeal that the convert has, uh, you know, especially in this parish. And I was rather embarrassed because uh, being a cradle and being a Russian, uh, you know, I, I, I took the path of least resistance, you know, in my, in my uh, early adulthood and kind of fell away. And when I came back and to hear, you know, people talk that they made a conscious, a, a conscious choice, you know, to, to pursue the truth, you know, I thought to myself, Everyone needs to have that. This parish is 95% is American. You know, there's only a few of us who are, you know, they call us cradle Orthodox Christians. We have never felt any different than most of the people here in this parish, which is why we like it so much. Батюшка, конечно, он поражает, насколько, как он отдает себя этой церкви, как он отдает себя общине. Несколько раз была за это время в Киеве, и я скучала вот именно за этой церковью, за этой маленькой общиной. Здесь мы своя семья, одна большая семья. I feel like uh, everybody just come in and join us, my family, you know, every once in a while, you know, when I had a chance to say, welcome all of the converts, you know, welcome to my faith. <laughs> So, uh, He's not you, you, you come here open, with open arms, you know, you're welcome. <laughs> Father Mark, get out of that. <laughs> One of the amazing traits of this community is their ability to attract Russians to a church where the services are almost completely in English. Despite the language barrier, people are drawn here because the services follow the traditional Russian typicon and most of the melodies are based on ancient Russian chant. Most of the services that I attended in the parish that I was raised. They're all performed here in this church. Even the really long ones, you know, we're, we're talking all the services that you'd have around Easter time in a cathedral happen in this small parish. It's not just the style of services that attracts people, but the parish ethos, which maintains that the divine services are to be the community's first priority. When we founded the parish, we founded it on the worship. We founded it on the Orthodox life and everybody seems to cling to that, to connect to that. So whether you're Ukrainian or Serbian or Russian or Southern, the common denominator is quite frankly that the worship of God is the center. I would assume a lot of Russian parishes, you know, have the Russianness. You know, we have the spirit of Russia here, you know, but that's really not what directs our day-to-day -day activities. We are a traditional Orthodox parish and I think I think as we go forward, that's the key. Having met several parishioners and witnessed the divine services, we were overwhelmed by the sincere and genuine Orthodox spirit of the parish. We came to South Carolina to discover why Orthodoxy was so appealing to Southerners. And suddenly, we found ourselves daydreaming. What would South Carolina look like if it were an Orthodox state? Every Orthodox Christian living in America has probably asked himself the same question. Could America become the next Orthodox country? It's hard to imagine a whole state, let alone an entire country becoming Orthodox, but still, what would it be like? If we look at St. Elizabeth's Church as a microcosm of South Carolina, the picture becomes much clearer. This parish has representatives from all walks of life. 
Young and old, rich and poor, scholars and the less educated, blue-collared and high-tech workers, happy and grumpy, you name it, they have it. But if we were to focus only on life in the parish, that would not be very interesting. It goes without saying that an Orthodox South Carolina would have hundreds of churches and thousands of faithful praying in them. But what would life be like outside of church in an Orthodox state? Father Columba Wilson, the parish deacon. He invited us to visit his home located just outside of the city to get a glimpse of how a typical Orthodox family lives in South Carolina. After getting lost several times and watching the GPS frantically search for signals and maps, we finally arrived at his home and realized that there was nothing typical about its location. Nestled deep in the woods, the Wilson family home is more of a homestead than a country house. While some may consider this lifestyle primitive, we found it to be relaxing and reminiscent of a secluded ski. My, well, my wife and I both like living out in the woods um, and nature, and we have two small daughters who we wanted to grow up. Um, being able to go out and play in the woods, not have to worry about cars. Our long-term goal is to uh, get chickens and goats, and we have a small kitchen garden. This is almost like a homestead farm here that you have. I mean, you're right, yeah, self-sustaining. It's, it's a really small um, homestead farm. You can see around that we really are out in the middle of nowhere. So in the morning you'll hear chickens and um, some of the neighbors up there have goats. So you'll hear things, but you won't necessarily see them. Walking through this charming house, we can see icons on the walls, spiritual literature on the shelves, children playing in the yard, a bishop having breakfast on the porch, women tending to the... Wait a minute, back that up. A bishop eating breakfast on the porch? <laughs> That's right. Believe it or not, even bishops enjoy country living. The vicar of the Eastern American Diocese, His Grace Bishop George of Mayfield, is a frequent visitor to the parish. And since he lives in one of the most secluded monasteries in America, it's no surprise that his primary choice of lodging in Colombia is the Wilson family home. This is just one example of what a home would look like in an Orthodox South Carolina. While visiting with the folks in Colombia, we noticed many interesting features about the spirit of South Carolinians, but perhaps most noticeably the sense of hospitality and friendliness. You would think that a man walking around in a cassock in the Deep South would attract awkward glances and uneasy vibes from passers-by, but that is most certainly not the case. Father Mark is the head librarian at the Lexington County Library, and his co-workers are used to seeing him at work wearing a cassock and cross. We spoke to one of them to find out what it was like to work for an Orthodox priest. I call, I call him Father Mark and Mark because if he's in his civilian, uh, or not in his cassock, I should say, he, uh, he's my boss. If he's uh, in his cassock, then he's Father Mark. Or if I see him at St. Elizabeth's in his vestments, he's Father Mark. He's just a very, what I would call a very interesting person. And I, as a boss, I'm really glad that he is my boss. Wherever we went, people were perfectly comfortable with a priest followed by an entourage of cassocks and camera equipment. In an Orthodox South Carolina, you could expect many more cassocks in the public square. And from the looks of it, people really wouldn't mind. As the day rolled on and we got hungry, we were determined to find the perfect restaurant that served nothing but fresh, local Southern cuisine. Since it was a Friday, we wanted to see if Southern cooking was conducive to Orthodox fasting. Just off of Route 1 in Lexington, we found the Farmer's Shed, a family-owned produce market, farm, and restaurant. The moment we pulled up, we knew that this was the place. The Cease family has been in the farming business for over 70 years and in 1999, they opened the Farmer's Shed Restaurant, which features down-home Southern-style meals made according to highly secretive family recipes. The market section of the restaurant was full of homemade jams, pies, meats, and a wide variety of produce from the farm. We followed our faithful guide, Father Mark, and embarked on our first Southern culinary adventure. Now, what do you think the reaction is gonna be right now to two, uh, two men in cassocks walking into a hardcore Southern uh, food joint here? I suspect they'll roll, roll with it just fine. You think so? Well, I think let's so. Let's find out. <laughs> yeah, you look totally different in that robe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I He's think. He's very enchanting. <laughs> <laughs> but we're here for shrimp and bread. That's what we're here for. All right. Well, have a seat, and I'll personally get your drinks. Thank, Thank you very much. Awesome. All right. I like the shrimp and grits. 
All right, and you get two sides with that. Uh, collards. Good choice. And the red potatoes. Roasted red. You got a choice of biscuit or cornbread. Oh, cornbread. You got it. And uh, Petya here will have the same exact thing. Whatever the good father wants, uh, I'll trust his, his expertise on southern cooking. While we were waiting for our shrimp and grits to arrive, we took a tour of the tiny restaurant and met some of the cooks. We also noticed that we were not the first film crew to visit this coveted southern jewel. On the wall, we found the trademark of Guy Fieri from Food Network's Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. Who would have thought that several years later, another film crew would be in the same restaurant trying to determine just how many Lenten options they could serve on the menu. After saying a prayer, we were ready to dig in and find out ourselves. Okay. This is um, southern shrimp and grits, corn grits. They're all local. And everything is really cooked to death. That's one of the indicative things of Southern. And this is all fresh from, from the farm. all fresh, the, and this everything. is from the Shirley's recipes. Um, I see fasting is very difficult for you here in the South, you know, such delicious meals. Fasting is very difficult. Well, let, let's dig in, let's see what we got here. I told her I can't eat no more because I'm getting fatter. Minutes later, I forgot with bacon on the platter. After such an authentic and delicious meal, we were ready to put our stamp of approval on the farmer's shed. What we didn't know was that this was the beginning of an extraordinary culinary journey through the South. We thought that we had the South all figured out after just one meal, but were we ever wrong? It turns out that there is one particular cuisine that is so close and dear to the heart of South Carolinians that they would most likely go to war over their right to preserve it. That's right, you guessed it, barbecue. Before this trip, we had no idea just how important barbecue was to the culture and natural identity of Southerners. We really can identify ourselves with barbecue. And each region of South Carolina has a particular type of barbecue. Now, barbecue, we need to pause here and understand to a Southerner, barbecue is a noun. It is not a verb. It's not something we do. It's a special kind of meat, so it's something that we eat. But in South Carolina, you could blindfold me and put a piece of barbecue in my mouth, and I could tell you which part of South Carolina that I'm in. To better understand the fine art of barbecue, Father Mark took us to the world-famous Maurice's Barbecue Restaurant in Columbia. When Maurice's father, Joe Bessinger, opened his first barbecue restaurant in 1939, his secret recipe for tangy mustard sauce became an overnight sensation with the locals. 73 years later, the restaurant has several locations and is still family-owned and operated. All the barbecue they serve is pit cooked for 24 hours over hickory wood coals using Joe's original recipe. I, w I wish that you could just be in here right now because of the smell, uh, the aroma, the, the atmosphere is just, it's overwhelming. I mean, just look at this menu. How, how do you not love South Carolina? It's, it's amazing. I think it's kind of once again, it came as no surprise to us that Father Mark is known as a regular at this fine establishment, and the proprietors are no strangers to cassocks. This made us think, how would orthodoxy and orthodox traditions impact the love affair that South Carolinians have with barbecue? For starters, Maurice's restaurant is no ordinary restaurant. The owners go out of their way to display their sense of patriotism and love for Jesus. A large display of barbecue sauce bottles and Bibles stands by the door, surrounded by American flags and portraits of classy Southern gentlemen. Make no mistake about it, the owners are certainly God-fearing people. Now, since there are no restrictions on pork outside of the fast, barbecue would naturally stay a part of the Orthodox lifestyle in the South. During fast days, the owners of Maurice's would have to get creative in offering some sort of Lenten alternatives, much like the owners of the farmer's shed. But if they were to embrace orthodoxy, it would be much easier for them to adapt to fasting because they would understand the true meaning of Lent and sacrifice. We are convinced that even a God-fearing barbecue cook would be willing to amend his recipes on Wednesdays and Fridays if he did it in honor of our Lord, who was betrayed and crucified on those days. And make no mistake about it, these same cooks would spend days preparing for Pascha so that the Orthodox faithful of South Carolina could break the fast with a meal that is near and dear to their hearts. Who knows, we might even see the creation of a statewide Bright Week barbecue festival to help local restaurant owners regain some of the profits that they lost during Lent. Just like some Russian parishes have pierogi and pirmieni fundraising sales, the sisterhoods in the South might offer barbecue and cornbread sales. 
There are countless ways that the local culture and food would be integrated into the lifestyles of the local Orthodox population, much like we see happening now in the Rokor parishes here. After three delightful days with the faithful in Columbia, it was time to move on to the other South Carolina parish of the Eastern American Diocese, named in honor of St. Cyril and Methodius, and located 90 miles to the southeast in the quaint town of Somerville. The rector of the parish, Archpriest Anastasia Trellis, is well known throughout the South as a larger-than-life batyushka with an even bigger heart. Thanks to his help and kind nature, the parish in Columbia was able to get started. It is been like a mother parish to us and before we had a priest we would go down there with some regularity I would serve as a deacon or people would go down there confess to Father Anastasi so we developed a unique relationship with him and in many respects um, maybe he doesn't he won't mind me saying this but he's a little he's a lot older than I am and he's served someone as a priestly mentor to me. Father Mark and I are close not in age um, but in uh, um, in, in distance and uh, what a joy it is to have him and, and St. Elizabeth's Parish there and of course the family and what have you. This type of cooperation between parishes is necessary for survival in the South. Since there are still relatively few Rokor parishes in the South, the need for strong ties between neighbors cannot be overstated. Although the two parishes are closely related, they have some differences just as siblings tend to have. They are the face of the new Rokor in America because they are both melting pots of different cultures and backgrounds, yet both are grounded in the traditional conservative worldview that defines the Russian church abroad. Parish makeups might be a little different. Uh, Father Anastasi being of a Greek background, some of their liturgical practices uh, are a little Greek sometimes, and we tend to follow more of a Russian practice. But in some sense, those differences are superficial, and our commonalities uh, run very, very deep. Despite all of this southern camaraderie, just like in any other state, there are rivalries among different groups of people in opposite corners of the state. Although they love each other dearly, Father Mark believes that there is one major difference between him and Father Anastasi. Nowhere near as charismatic as Father Anastasi. Father Anastasi is Greek and he's from Charleston, which means he's of the chosen people twice over. And I could not in any way have the same charm as he has with his accent. Pate, I know what you're saying, but I can't agree you're doing it backwards. Oh. Lord have mercy, <laughs> Lord have mercy. One, I thank him very much for the compliment. Indeed, it is a blessing. Um, I was born in Charleston, South Carolina, which was uh, the seat of the Confederacy too at some point. Um, we're close and that's important uh, to us and uh, he's a young brother for me which is encouraging sometime and he's always lively and what have you. The closer we got to Somerville, the more excited and eager we were to see what wonders awaited us. We happened to visit the parish on a weekday that coincided with the feast of the Royal New Martyrs of Russia. Some in our crew were celebrating their names days and Father Anastasi enthusiastically arranged to serve a liturgy and hear our confessions, despite the fact that it was a work day. As soon as the liturgy ended, we realized that we just purchased front row tickets to the best show of hospitality in the South. We had heard rumors about Father Anastasi's legendary charm and hospitality, but we can safely say that we were not prepared for what happened next. There were about a dozen people in church for the liturgy, and suddenly, there appeared several large trays of delicious meals in the parish refectory. We weren't sure what was going on because the kitchen sat dark and silent, and yet tray after tray kept coming out of nowhere. It turns out that Father Nastasi is not only the rector of St. Cyril and Methodius Church, but also the chef and owner of the Continental Corner Greek restaurant located next door. We couldn't believe it. When Father Anastasi finished the liturgy, he joined us in the form of a human whirlwind, buzzing around to make sure that everyone was eating and had about seven times the normal amount of food that any human is physically able to consume in one day. We spoke to some of the parishioners to find out if this was normal for them, or if this was an attempt to sway the camera crew with delicious home-cooked meals. Quite frankly, either way we would have been happy with the response. Не выпустит, во-первых, церкви никого, чтобы не покушали после службы. Он всех кормит. Вот. А вот так как в такие дни, вот и нас мало, 
Он везет, и мы идем к нему в ресторан, и он кушает, кормит бесплатно, как и тут мы кушаем бесплатно. Когда очень много служб, мы видим, как, какой он уставший, но он никогда не скажет нет. Я не знаю, где он находит сил, наверное, Бог ему все-таки дает их. After we finally finished eating, or better yet, after we finally convinced Father Anastasi that we couldn't eat another bite, it was time to get the official tour of the parish grounds and restaurant. St. Cyril and Methodius Church is located in the town square which provides many missionary opportunities. If the Orthodox crosses on the church or the icons in the restaurant don't pique the interests of the locals, a procession in the middle of the night through the town square ought to do the trick. Uh, midnight Pascha, we come out here and we read the gospel. We have two uh, Somerville Police Department units, two canine units at each end of the street. Um, people start flying into town after midnight and then they see the police cars, they start slowing down, then they get to this point and they see all these candles and white robes and this kind they said, Lord have mercy, the Ku Klux Klan must be starting back again. <laughs> and then they realize that it's the Orthodox celebrating Holy Pascha. But it's very nice being um, on, the, on the main square of, of Somerville because especially in a lot of Orthodox countries, that's where you find your, your principal churches especially is on the main square. Yes. Uh, how about the locals? How do, are they used to the, the fact that there's always a, a man walking around in a dress, as they say? Or, uh, or? They are, they are, and then and sometimes people raise an eyebrow, and others are just, it's just become just, uh, after all so many years, just, uh, they're just used to it. And From the sound of it, orthodoxy is not foreign to the people of this 15-square-mile town. In an orthodox South Carolina, you could expect to see more cupolas and three-bar crosses in town squares. But what about this restaurant? Our curiosity was at its peak, and we were dying to find out how a Greek man, born in Charleston, opened a restaurant in South Carolina and then became a priest of the Russian church abroad. It almost sounds like the opening of a really bad joke, but in this case, there was nothing funny about it, unless, of course, you explain it in the way Father Anastasi does. And initially, we were just open for lunch, and then we opened for Friday nights only, and only one item was offered, and so sometimes they were telling us, uh, couples were telling us, you're going to cause us to divorce. She wants to come on fish nights, and I want to come on the nights that y'all have lamb. So they said, y'all have to have more than one item, and so that's how we started developing a menu. Speaking of designing menus for Greek restaurants, there was a question on my mind that I just had to ask. Uh, Father, many of us have seen the, the famous movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, yes. uh, which made Greek diners and, and Greeks famous all over yes. America. Um, yes. Is your restaurant sort of like that restaurant? How, how similar is it? My Greek, uh, Big Fat Greek Wedding, I have to see again because half of the time I was in my lap laughing and I missed part of the parts including when they, the children got a home, I didn't realize it was next door to their parents. So, but so. it embarrassed our Greek cousins in Greece. <laughs> they were furious over this. They said, this is terrible. Well, would you say that the matter it, is, it is somewhat representative. So you think it's accurate? Of not only the Greeks, of every culture has similar things, <laughs> yes. Do you have a lot of locals that like Greek food? When we opened up initially, and because of being in seminary for six years in Boston, I got exposed to New York-style delis. So we would order and have shipped down here uh, rare uh, roast beef for the deli, because we had deli sandwiches too. And then when we opened up, the, 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 the southern ladies would come in and they'd say, you boys gonna have to learn how to cook your roast beef a little longer, it's not done, you see. That was 40 years ago. Today now, rare roast beef, because of the influx of all them Yankees to the south, now of course, everybody knows about rare roast beef now, even the southerners. This building we're going in, when we took it over, it was the dress shop 20 years earlier when I was a child, it was Jack's place, and they had beer, and they had jukeboxes, and pinball machines, and the, the, the doors all folded. The whole front would open up, and you could hear, Irene, good night, Irene, and so forth. You know, those were the days. Father, I, 
I noticed the Kursk icon here. Ah, that is because when the Kursk icon came on its first visit, um, in remembrance of that, we put the Kursk icon up there because we had the Kursk icon in this room now twice. Sorry for the interruption, but we will make sure that you have dessert here before you leave, or if you're too full, take the dessert with you. We will tell your server. You Wonderful, wanna, thank you. Yes, indeed. Want to just give us some quick impressions? Is this your first time here? Or do you no, I've this? come here a lot. And, and why do you keep coming back? Um, it's a different flavor that's not located anywhere else, so this is just a place when you want something different, and it's, it's so flavorful that you just you have to come back. They get dessert for here, complimentary dessert for here, or to go, which you have to tell the circle. Right. Ah, St. Ephrosinos, the cook. Well, we just thought St. Ephrosinos, he's been here many years with us, and you know, there were those that made fun of him and so forth, and then later it would reveal, be revealed to them that, t that he was uh, uh, a, a holy man and so forth, and then they were embarrassed because they had thought uh, harsh things about him and so forth. So and you can see they're fading just like I am because they've been here many years. <laughs> yes. Right now the main galley is not much. Uh, pitch hut. Uh, actually, our staff has to be very well organized and very well trained because this is really a little facility compared to most restaurants for the number of people we serve in the table. And Chris is also Orthodox Christian. He is an Arab. Uh, comes from a wonderful Arab family, and um, now do you cook, Father, yourself? I do, uh, especially uh, soup. I need to make a soup today, and um, others used to make them. And I see where they want me also to make Greek dressing. There's a secret recipe only a couple of us have. So just because it's your restaurant doesn't excuse you from cooking. Oh no! In fact, the great responsibility the buck ends here. The buck ends, the buck ends here. You may not get the buck. But the buck certainly ends here. Order up, Padre. Where's that going, darling? It's going to. I know it. I know it. Booth four, one person. And before, is that going from the top of the box? Whose table is booth one? What is it like working for an Orthodox priest? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. He's the nicest person I ever met. I wake up every morning looking forward to go to work. He cares. You know, most most employers really don't care about their employees. You know, but he does. You can tell. He's got a big heart. I've been here since 1999, and they couldn't kick me out. Honestly, security guards would have to take me out of here. Why is that? It's like we work for family. I mean, pa Padre treats us like little kids, and basically we're his kids. I mean, he loves us, and we love him. Why is it important to have fellowship over a table? When we look at the early church, it was an integral part, a very uh, important part of um, of the spiritual life of the, of the parish, of the Eucharistic Assembly. A lot of times because of our schedule, because so many children activities, we don't have children sitting with parents to have meals. We don't have the opportunities. Everybody's in a rush. We don't even have a chance to stop a moment to thank God for what we have before us, you know. It is these very values, family, hospitality, piety, independence, and an adherence to tradition that make the American South and South Carolina in particular fertile grounds for the spreading of orthodoxy. The culture based on these values has made the South one of the best last stands against the worldwide rise of materialism and secularism. The future belongs to the South. Indeed, there has never been a better time to be orthodox in Dixie. God bless you for this wonderful opportunity of having you with us and we look forward to many, many more coming to the South. Remember, nothing can be better than to be in Carolina in the morning. God bless you. Nothing could be finer than to be in Carolina in the morning. No one could be sweeter than my sweetie when I meet her in the morning. Where the morning glories twine around the dark. Whispering pretty stories, I long to hear once more. Rolling with my girlie, where the dew is pretty early in the morning. Butterflies all flutter up and kiss each little buttercup at dawn. If I had a lad and lap for only a day. 
<laughs> I'd make a wish here, but I'd say nothing could be finer than to be in Carolina in the morning.